Hey, uh, well, good afternoon. Um, look, I'd, firstly, I'd like to congratulate the organising committee for um, for this event. You know, obviously, with the crowd of people that we have here, the crowd of people we had in the Waikato, there was an obvious need, and uh, and, and the need has been catered for. Um, but I do want to encourage you, though, is is questions. I thought we, you know, I was I was saying to everyone when we were coming to Ashburton that you know this is a real hotbed of questions. I can't get out of this place at night when I come down here to give talks. So why don't you start thinking about questions? And if you want to plug anyone's nose, I'm volunteering Brendan's, all right? Mm -hmm. Mine's been broken so often that there's no fun in breaking mine. It breaks when I sneeze. Um, now, as people standing at the back, do you, do you guys want to filter in and grab seats? Or uh, feel free to anyway. You want you want to drop my thinking by, by moving through, through the audience. Um, look, uh, what, what, the, what the organizing committee asked me to talk about was the science behind supplementary feeding. And um, when I saw so my intent was, we would go and ask farmers why do they feed supplements. Now, when I came and told farmers that feed supplements, what I wanted to do, which was to provide the science behind feeding supplements, not many of them wanted to talk to me. So I got a couple of friends to go and ask farmers that feed supplements in Ireland and New Zealand why they feed supplements. And the reasons that came up were um, there were many reasons, but they could be grouped into four. One was to prevent body condition score loss in early lactation and by doing that, get cows pregnant. Now, I'm hearing a lot about that in Canterbury at the moment. Apparently, there's a veterinary report out there talking about how if you feed supplements, you've got fatter cows and mating, and therefore, you're going to get more cows pregnant. We'll talk about that. Um, teas of management, you know, better shed flow, um, uh, all those types of things that I've heard since I was yay high um, inside the milking shed. Um, Cow-centric judgments, you know, if I don't feed my cows, my cows are going to be hungry. I don't want my cows hungry those types of, of, of things. And then uh, for to increase milk solids production and by doing that to increase profitability. Now, look, I'm happy to answer questions on any of those, but because of the limited time, and I really do want to get your questions, I'm going to leave out those two in the middle. Um, happy to talk about them during question time, but um, I'm going to focus on these two. So firstly, prevent body condition score loss in early lactation. So look, the Dairy NZ team that I was part of up until very recently are regarded globally in the scientific world as being the experts in body condition. Not because their group leader had such a good body condition, because of all, all of the work that we had actually done in body condition score over the years. And all of this is freely available. If you're interested in reading it, Journal of Dairy Science website, once it goes back a year, it's all free back for the last 100 years. So, and, and because of all the work that we did, we were invited to write a review um, on body condition score and its association with dairy cow productivity, health, and welfare. So effectively, everything that body condition score controls and everything that controls body condition score. It's a 40-page document. It's got everything you ever wanted to ask about body condition score and weren't interested enough to ask. So um, and I'm, I'm, I'm putting that up there kind of, not, not so much bragging, but say this is one area where we do really know our shit. So when, when you hear people talking, pardon my friend, when you hear people talking about using supplements to alter body condition score, there's a bit of truth and a whole pile of nonsense. So the reason I was given, uh, we, feed, we feed so that cows don't lose as much body condition in early lactation, and therefore more of them will get pregnant. Well, if we focus in on um, early lactation here, now the red line is cows on a total mixed ration. No pasture in the diet, doing 12,000 kilos of, of, of milk, around 750 kilos of solids, versus the cows in the green line grazing, doing 450 to 475 kilos of solids, grass, grass, silage diet, at number one dairy in the Waikato back 15, 16 years ago when we did this work. Okay, so these, are, these were all in the same farm, the same genetics of cows, um, just being fed extremely different diets. And people focus on this, and they focus on this when I see less extreme examples of supplementary feeding versus pasture as well. That there's a difference in body condition score at peak, and that must be because of the feeding. I can assure you, from the physiological point of view of the animal, the reason for that difference is that difference. They have fat, and therefore they end up fatter at mating. It has virtually nothing to do with nutrition during early lactation. Now, there is a little bit of, obviously the grass line here is sloping to a greater degree than the red line, but only slightly. It's a very, very small effect. So um, basically, we have bred an animal that is uh, that for the first 30 days after calving, nutrition has no influence on her body condition score loss. It is her genetics and the condition that she calved in. And at that point, thankfully, in our system, if it's 
if we've got our stopping rate and our calving date right, we're starting to head into a, a reasonable, um, into a balanced state of, of pasture versus need. All right, so prevent body condition or loss in early lactation. Look, it's, it's not a good reason to feed supplements. How about getting pregnant? Right, okay, getting the cow pregnant. Uh, <laughs> this, this was a paper that we published earlier this year. Scott McDougall led the authorship of it. And um, look, I, I know there's a lot of numbers up here, and I'm going to focus in when uh, this thing catches up with me. I'm going to focus in on these three volumes. And again, I know there's a lot of numbers, so I'm actually going to blow it up so you can so you can see it better. All right, so what we had was three farms in the White Cattle, granted, we weren't in Canterbury, but I can assure you this biology holds no matter where I've gone in the world. Uh, so we had three farms, two of them reasonably high input, and one of them pasture only. Uh, farm two was pasture only farm. And the experiment was to determine whether if we fed a high starch diet, would we get cows cycling earlier, or would we get more cows pregnant? So I'm sure many of you will have heard nutritionists talk about this. Uh, and so in farm one and three, we took out uh, some, uh, uh, some palm kernel and soy hulls that was in their ration, and we put in maize grain, kept the same amount of energy going in there, two separate herds run, run separately, and in, and in farm two, it was pasture only, so half the herd got a maize grain, barley based concentrate, and the other half didn't. All right? So if we look at their six week in calf rate, you can see that the only difference was in farm one, which is a, a very high input farm to begin with, that when we put maize grain into the diet as opposed to palm kernel or soy oats, we actually got a significant reduction in six week in calf rate. No difference at all in the other two farms. And in, in the same, in terms of final empty rate, farm one on the high starch ration, um, a far greater empty rate than the guy, the, the, the fiber of the, the farm getting fiber, cows getting fiber. So now you, you might say, well, geez, that can't be true, that's just an aberration. Well, there's an interesting paper that's just come out of Ireland. And I mean, this is hot off the press, and I mean, it's so hot off the presses, it doesn't come out until next month. So you're, you're the second audience to see this in the world. Uh, and, and Brendan's colleagues have a habit of really cutting to the chase. So instead of actually feeding the cow starch to drive up their blood glucose, they stuck a needle into the jugular vein <laughs> and pumped blood glucose into the cows for several weeks. And the top, at the top line here, this cow is getting, um, getting the glucose, you can see that the, their blood glucose concentration has increased from around 4.3 millimoles per liter to 5 millimoles per liter. But they've effectively created a diabetic cow. Um, the insulin, insulin followed suit. Again, the black line at the top is insulin. You can see that as we get out to, to about 10 days post the glucose infusion, you're starting to see a significant increase in insulin. And because of that, the ketone body levels drop. So these are all basically physiological, what we would expect physiologically for the cow. But they managed to increase the glucose, which of course is going to have a great effect on reproduction. And what they found when they, um, they transferred embryos into the uterus, again, the black bar is what you're interested in. The length of the embryo and the total size of the embryo was decreased in cows that had higher levels of blood glucose. Now, these guys have done an excellent experiment. It's really nice. It's not new. We've been saying this for 20 years. Workout in the UK has been saying this for 20 years. That yes, you can affect body condition score to a small extent by feeding them. But any gain you're going to get, you're probably going to undermine. Because starch, high sugar, high, high insulin levels in the blood of a cow while you're trying to breed them it is an increased risk factor for embryo loss. Not for keeping cows pregnant. So again, the science wouldn't support the idea of feeding supplements to prevent body condition score loss and early lactation and therefore increase reproduction. Now, I'm hoping that is going to lead to some questions. But the second one, I really have to hate having people up behind the lights. That's usually where snipers uh, are. And, and I've become particularly sensitive to that when I joined FBI. <laughs> and even more sensitive in mid South Canterbury. All right. So, so the, the, what, fo to focus on the idea, excuse me, of increasing milk solids production to increase profit. If I can get this picker to work for me. Excellent. So look, I want to I want to show you this this work out of Lincoln University. So again, highly relevant, although it's 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 national. It's, 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 it's an analysis of the national database. Um, so does feeding supplements uh, increase milk solids production? Well, going from low input to medium input. Um, increased milk solids production per hectare by about 66 kilos of milk solids per hectare, or going from low input to high input, increased milk solids production per hectare by about 150 kilos. So, no doubt there, I don't think that's rocket science, most people would accept that. But 
putting more feed into the system for producing more milk. Now this is the average of three years, 2011, 2013. And I'll come back to this in a few minutes. Sorry, I'm pointing the wrong direction. So a number of the uh, a number of the speakers, including Brendan, talked about the importance of cost control. And we've been banging on about this now for 10, 11, 12 years, really, really strongly. And most people accept it, that if, if, um, if operating expenses are low, profitability is more likely to be high. And interestingly enough, it doesn't matter where I've gone in the country or where I've gotten, gone in the world, this graph holds true. So it doesn't matter whether I'm dealing with high input cows in New York State or I'm dealing with uh, low input systems in, in Northland. Um, when we look at the data across multiple farms, the greater the operating expenses, the lower the profitability on average. The reason why I put that up there is we've been successful getting people to recognize this, but this hides a multitude of sins. Um, and, and the reason why uh, I'm saying that is, if the clicker will work for me, um, is it really came home to roost in a, in a Twitter conversation that people were trying to draw me into in the last week. And I, um, and I stayed out of it. For, I've obviously showed some common sense for once in my life. But this, this was a, an, an Irish farmer actually, and uh, he tweeted, he was being drawn into the conversation, but he tweeted that profit, no matter how big or small, is still profit. Well, that's absolutely true. <laughs> I don't think you should take that to the bank when you're looking to borrow money. But, it, uh, but what that basically means is that people are, are not actually cons um, considering the cost of the marginal milk that they're producing. So what I want to do is I want to talk about marginal milk for a second and, and talk about the cost of it using New Zealand and Irish data to talk about that. So if we look, so this is a very, very standard marginal cost, marginal revenue uh, graph. Now when I'm talking about marginal milk, so we're all on the same page, marginal milk is the additional or the reduced, but let's say the additional milk when you make a system change. So if you've got a grass-only system or a very, very low input system and you decide, right, I'm going to put in 500 kilograms of supplement of cow, the additional milk you get, that's your marginal milk. Or alternatively, if you're putting in two ton of cow and you realize you're not making any money, so you want to reduce that, and you pull a ton of cow out of that, the reduction in milk, that's your marginal milk. If you're milking twice a day and you decide I'm going to go once a day and you reduce your milk production by, let's say, 10%, that's marginal milk. So Hopefully everyone gets that, um, but it, again, it's a, I hope it's a great topic of conversation. So it's the difference in your milk solids production when you make a change to your system. Now, initially, uh, when, we, when we make changes to our system, you know, we, we do often get some uh, efficiencies of scale. You know, we've got, we've got enough shade, we've got enough labor, we don't increase electricity by much, and so our costs don't go up a lot, yet our revenue goes up. And, and therefore our, our, our marginal cost actually diminishes. A bit like using a small amount of nitrogen fertilizer. And then as we use more and more of those inputs, our marginal cost tends to increase. Now that's not a problem until the marginal cost passes the marginal revenue. The black line, that's your milk price. So as long as the cost of the extra milk you're producing, or the milk you've taken out of the system, is less than that milk price, then you're making money by doing it. So, if you're, if, so again, just to state that, if the cost of the marginal milk, <laughs> right, I, I might just back up a little bit there. Uh, technology was never my strong point. Can we go back to that graph? Back a little bit further, a little bit further. I can hear it beeping in my head. Back a bit further, and further. <laughs> I, I keep backing up until I get back. To, Excellent. Perfect. Perfect. Stop. 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 Right. So, as, as long as the marginal cost graph is less than the milk price, um, we're making money. Um, and as you can see by the red box, you don't have to be an economist to know, to, to realize, obviously, that if the cost of your marginal milk is greater than what you're being paid for it, you're losing money on that milk. Now, I want to be very, very careful with this statement because I think one of the reasons why we've ended up in the crap that we are in and the discussions that we constantly have is for the last 10 years we've talked about profitable systems and unprofitable systems. And the people that we were talking about having unprofitable systems were profitable. They knew they were profitable. Their accountant was telling them they were profitable. Their bank manager, they were able to pay down some debt each year. They weren't an unprofitable system. However, in those situations, what we were talking about was some of the milk that was being produced wasn't profitable. So the base milk 
was very, very profitable, some of the marginal milk wasn't. And that's what I want to talk about now. Hopefully this thing's not going to bounce ahead. Okay, give me an example. It's a farm in the Waikato, and I'm only using it because it's a really, really nice story. It's a young guy that came back farming in the South Waikato. His father got sick, and parents were both old, so he came back. And he was only back a couple of months when he realized he was losing money hand over fist. There was absolutely no money being made in this business. And so he called in Derry and said, he called in some of my colleagues in the extension team back then, and, um, and they did a whole farm assessment, so, uh, you know, asking his goals, where he wanted to be, etc. Any of you that have been through a whole farm assessment will know the process. And then suggested some specific changes that would uh, allow the business to return to a profitable uh, status, positive cash flow. Um, which he did. He didn't take all the stuff out of the system by a long shot, but he made a lot of changes and he, um, he turned his business around. And, and then when I went in afterwards uh, to talk with him and, and analyze his business, we went through his accounts. And so this is over several years. This is his, his average cost of production. So on the horizontal here, we've got the average cost of production. On the vertical here, what this allows us to do over multiple years, we're able to trace the changes to the system. This is his mar the cost of the marginal milk he was producing. So in the salt white cattle, if you're not putting any supplements into your system, you can produce milk. I'm, I'm almost afraid to hit that button. You can produce milk for around two dollars ninety. So, and we've got farmers in the South White Cattle that are doing that. All right. If his average cost of production was four dollars, the increased milk that he was producing was actually costing him. It's almost a drum roll going. Five dollars sixty. So, as long as he was being paid more than five dollars sixty, his average cost of production of four dollars, he was he was making money. <coughs> If his average cost of production was $5, if the cost of the marginal milk was $10.75. The average cost of milk production in New Zealand is currently sitting at around $4.85, which suggests that there's a huge chunk of marginal milk that's being produced in somewhere the $8, $9 price range. And I'll show you some more in a second to back myself up on that. The first milk we took out of his system was costing him $17 a kilo to produce. All right. The reason why I'm, I, I, I put this up first is because I, I, can, I can see some of the comments in your feedback sheets afterwards going, I thought that's just Roach using facts to support his own biases. <laughs> this, is, this is what the, I didn't get anywhere near. None of my grubby hands didn't touch it until it came out afterwards. And uh, it's straight out of Lincoln University. What, what infuriates me is I've been trying to do this work for about a decade and I couldn't get my hand on the data. And next time Lincoln University published it. Um, so again, three years, 2011, 2012, 2013, reasonable milk price years, right across the country. They've done a very good analysis. I think it can be done slightly better, but they've done a very good analysis. Um, so they increased milk production by in increasing intensification. The marginal cost of that milk, again the drum roll, was $7.50 to $7.60. So on average, the average cost of the marginal milk produced in New Zealand by feed intensification in 2011, 2012, 2013, was between $7.50 and $7.60. Now, I was going to explain why. I'm going to go back to an experiment um, that was done in the Waikato 20 years ago, um, but it's extraordinarily relevant. And the reason why I want to show you this is the comparisons were really, really useful. So the comparisons allowed us to compare a very high stock system, 4.4 cows per hectare, so a cow per hectare too much for the Waikato. Um, either without supplements or using 1.3 ton of maize grain per cow or 1.1 ton of maize silage a cow to fill genuine feed deficits. So that's one comparison. We've got a highly stocked situation. We're going to fill feed deficits. Or alternatively, the idea... Uh, we move on one. Perfect, thank you. Or alternatively, the idea of moving on from a low stock system and using feed to increase our stocking rate. So there, there are two very different uses of feed. Right, so let's look at the first one first. The marginal cost of putting either maize grain or maize silage into the system um, to fill a genuine feed deficit, so a high stock situation, was $6.30 or $5.50 with the maize silage or $6.30 with the maize grain. Doesn't sound astronomical. I can, I can, you can probably live with that, I suppose, um, depending on what the milk price was. But if you look at the idea of reducing stocking rate or using supplements to increase stocking rate, the marginal cost of that milk was, I get out of people's way, I realize I don't make a good window, is uh, between $8, uh, between $7.80 and 
So it's very, very different. So when you see people doing uh, incomplete marginal analysis or partial budgets, where they look at the cost of feed and then they look at the response and they go, oh, I can make a lot of money in this scenario, it really depends on how feed is being used. So strategic, uh, just strategic use of, of feed to fill genuine feed deficits, and uh, depending on the milk price, can be profitable. Um, however, if you're, used, if you're doing that every year, that's not strategic use of feed. That means you pushed your stocking rate up and you need that feed all the time. In that situation, that milk is very expensive on average. So let me come back to it. So between $7.80 and $8, very similar to the national database. Why is that? Well, this, these are data out of, out of Ireland. Um, um, a PhD student of myself and Brendan's actually. Again, all right. So what this shows is as, as feed expenses go up in Ireland, the average Irish dairy farmer, the variable and the fixed expenses go up, obviously. This is the variable expenses. So for every one euro an Irish farmer spends on feed, their total expenses go up one euro 18. Sorry, their variable expenses go up one euro 18. So for every one dollar they spend on feed, their variable expenses go up one dollar 18. So you, you'd imagine that's not really surprising. What is surprising is the so-called fixed costs those things that are supposed to be fixed also increase by 35 cents for every one dollar spent. So the total increase in costs in Ireland, on average, when a farmer spends one euro on feed, total costs go up around one euro 53. Now you can say that uh, maybe maybe that's um, just because they're Irish and they don't know what they're doing, or you could uh, look at our data here in New Zealand, and in the white cattle, for every dollar a white cattle farmer spends on feed their total expenses go up $1.68. Here in Canterbury, it's exactly the same as Ireland. Um, and in the UK, for every pound the UK farmer spends on feed, their total expenses go up on pound 60. When you consider the differences in the regions of New Zealand and across the world, in terms of geographic location, the consistency of that um, inflation is just extraordinary. Yep, thanks, Paul. All right, so again, milk solids production to increase profit. I don't think you could use that argument. For more, in the moment, for most. Now, that's a challenge to you. I'm hoping it's going to dig out some questions. All right, one thing I do want to do though is one final cost. Very question. And that's the environment. And this is what people don't think about when they're doing the marginal analysis because when we look at nitrate leach, uh, sorry, the environment, we're look, we got two concerns. We've got nitrate leaching and we've got the carbon footprint. All right? And this has become a big part of my life um, over the last six months. So I do want to put a, a myth to bed, which we only talked about just before lunch, and that's that stocking rate is what controls nitrate leaching. That's absolute nonsense. So these are, these are measured data in the white cattle, which shows that as stocking rate goes up, nitrate leaching comes down. Now this is a system where no feed is coming in, okay? Now, that's not an effect of stocking rate, because I know Mike Manny is going to have me up about this if I don't actually qualify that. That is an effect of lactation, because when we don't bring in feed, our way of managing those, uh, that system is by shortening the lactation of the cows, getting rid of calls early, drying cows off that are thin, etc., and move on. And so as lactation length increases, we see an increase in nitrate leaching. All right? Now, I don't want you to go away saying, thinking that, oh, geez, I can increase my stocking rate uh, and, and my nitrate leaching is going to go down. Um, Overseer doesn't predict that, by the way, so you've got, you got a problem there. Um, but the other problem is, that's in a system that doesn't bring in feed. If you bring in feed, if the clicker would work, if you bring in feed to increase stocking rate, and your nitrate leaching, your nitrate leaching goes up considerably. All right. On, no, I'll leave it there. Your nitrate leaching goes up considerably if um, if you don't invest in some concrete and stainless steel, and there was inverted commas around that invest. Right. Uh, the other the other factor was uh, carbon footprint. So this is the that stock rate. Uh, sorry, that, that intensification experiment I showed you earlier. Remember, five dollars fifty to six dollars thirty in terms of uh, uh, marginal cost, or eight dollars in terms of marginal cost. You want to see what the carbon footprint is? So we go from um, around 80, 88 tons of carbon equivalent to 115 or 130 tons of carbon equivalent. So we increase our carbon footprint by 50%. We didn't make any more money. Um, there's a whole pile of marginal costs here that we need to factor in. All right, so in summary, geez, where did that come from? Actually, geez, I, I've got so many pictures for you now. 
I mean, I, I thought, <laughs> roll on next year, huh? <laughs> All right. So my other picture here is there's, a, there's an industry commentator that doesn't really like the message that I'm giving here. And he, he wrote a, 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 um, an article last year. Um, and he suggested that I use data like a drunk uses a lamppost to lean on rather than for illumination. But the irony of his statement was at least I use data, I suppose. Um, <laughs> So to sum up, supplements can increase milk solids production pregnant, there's no question about it right per cow. Um, they can extend lactation length um, and they can increase body condition score in late lactation in the dry period. However, the, the reasons that were given, I think people need to be think about them very carefully because we have a habit of being consumers. We buy an emotion and we justify it logic. Supplements do not prevent body condition score loss in early lactation. They do not improve reproduction as a general rule. And for the most part, they do. <laughs> they don't improve farm profitability. So I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. And um, look, if, if, uh, one thing I did want to say, if you've got any spare coins in your pocket, the reason why I look like a shaggy dog is for, is for men's health. Every year I put my marriage at risk because of my love of young men. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I'm, go, I'm going for November. I'm actually going to shave off the middle of this tomorrow. So I never grow a mustache because I look like a 1960s porn star when I grow a mustache. <laughs> And it doesn't look good in the minister's office. So I, I look forward to any support I can get this afternoon. Okay, just, a couple, just give me a minute. I'm just going to get a couple of images out of my mind. <laughs> <laughs>